the students of uh, MPhil as well, uh, which is uh, something that I was not expecting uh, actually, but I'm uh, really <laughs> happy. So uh, uh, to start uh, today's uh, lecture, uh, I would like to introduce our very honorable guest, uh, Dr. Kamral Huda, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council uh, based in Washington, DC, and an associate adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, previously, he co-founded the Center for Global Policy uh, a nonpartisan think tank the focus, uh, that focuses on U.S. security and foreign policies in the Muslim-majority countries, where he was vice president. Um, Dr. Huda also established a CGP Security and Violent Extremism Program, where he supervised the program's research activities and was instrumental in interfacing the U.S. policy and academic uh, researcher. Um, uh, he has also worked as a senior policy advisor um, uh, of the uh, Department of State. Uh, Dr. Huda worked at uh, U.S. Institute of uh, Peace as a senior expert researcher and uh, resident of Islam and focused on conflict resolution, peace building research, religious peace building, field training uh, to civil society members. Uh, and beside that, he supervised and managed the development of the field of conflict resolution and mediation studies in religious and public schools in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and various parts of the Middle East. Um, uh, as we all know, and because of this book, I had uh, requested uh, Dr. Hada to um, uh, join us for a uh, talk, um, uh, which are uh, students might be interested in was basically uh, this book that uh, recently uh, got published uh, in Urdu, uh, translated in Urdu. And uh, the book that uh, he's the editor of uh, is Crescent and Dove, Peace and Conflict Resolution in Islam. Uh, and uh, not only it is translated in Urdu, but in other uh, six languages or five languages as well. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Ruda uh, served as yes. director of the Countering Violent Extremism Project at uh, uh, USIP, and he uh, designed and developed numerous online training courses uh, for uh, USIP's Academy of Conflict Analysis and Conflict Transformation. Uh, he was uh, listed uh, in the Muslim 500s the world's most influential Muslims in 2016, 2017, 2018, 19, and 2020, uh, which was published by the Royal Strategic Islamic Center in Amman, Jordan. Uh, he's an uh, adjunct associate professor of Georgetown's Conflict Resolution Graduate Program and has also taught at UCLA, Boston College, Brandeis University, and the College of Holy Cross. Uh, Dr. Huda has published uh, many books and uh, they got uh, translated into uh, various uh, languages because of the importance of uh, um, uh, the area or the subject that uh, he uh, is an expert on. And he received research uh, grants uh, from uh, Social Research Council uh, and other institutes uh, around the globe. He's also, uh, he, has, uh, he was twice a Fulbright scholar and has provided interviews uh, on CNN, MSNBC, BBC, the Atlantic Monthly, Time Magazine, Newsweek, Al Jazeera, and other major news uh, outlets. Uh, and um, about his academic uh, uh, background, he has earned his doctorate from University of California, Los Angeles uh, in political and intellectual history, his Master of Arts in History of Asia and Middle East, and he earned his Bachelor of Arts honors from uh, Colgate University in International Relations and uh, Philosophy and Religion. Now, I would request him without uh, 
uh, taking more time and uh, coming between uh, Dr. Rukhuda uh, and the audience, I would request him uh, to uh, start his lecture uh, for our audience. Mm -hmm. And please, Dr. Rukhuda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Majid. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Good morning or good evening, good afternoon to wherever our colleagues and friends. Thank you for such a beautiful, kind introduction and I really appreciate uh, the time spending with you and your colleagues and friends uh, in different parts of, of the university area. So thank you so much. Um, you know, we, when you asked me to, to come and speak, I, of course, I, I was very excited because I, 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 cause I think this is a topic of not just the field of conflict resolution, peace building, but was this from, from Islamic perspectives of what is it with Islam principles, um, there's a lot of misunderstandings, not only in academics, but um, in also NGO world and in the professional world. So professional conflict resolution world. Thank you for this opportunity. And if I may, I'd like to show you uh, what I'd like to structure uh, this this uh, uh, lecture and how I like to structure. First is a a brief background of the field and what I would, this big field called conflict resolution and just just a minute or two on what is why was established what 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 is this field about and what what was its purpose huh? and then really hone into uh, the second part of the lecture which is really uh, major key points in conflict resolution and third is which is I think um, the field that attracted me. Uh, to is, uh, is the issue of, is Islam a religion of peace? Or is Islam a religion of violence, right? These are the big questions that are existing, a perennial, continuing. Um, and I think particularly in this part of the world of Pakistan, in South Asia, the way things are presented or discussed um, can always be binary, you know, either this or that, you know, and who are the authorities of speaking about Islam? So I'd like to speak on that. I'm leaving that best part, if I may, to the end. But I must say, as a teaser, uh, as you said before, I was a professor of Islamic studies, comparative theology at Boston College, and it was really a world I was trained in intellectual history, uh, really of texts, you know, mainly of what did people write before our time? intellectual history. It's a very important field because from that we learn a variety of culture, intellectual culture, uh, the way people exchange ideas. However, um, as much as I love that and I continue to do that, it gave me the basic grounding of thinking of our modern times of how to think methodically, meticulously, and with data, social scientifically, on how to address uh, this field of religion and conflict resolution. And that's the field I think I'm in, um, and, and the field I, I, I'm a student of, and I'm very happy to share some thoughts with you today, inshallah. Um, so my first section, if, uh, if you have permission, is is about this field and and, um, and is, let's be honest it was a field that was developed in the west uh, academic field practitioner field post world war ii and there was a major concern on making sure that uh, after world war ii we had almost 65 million people dying dead uh, from just the war and um, and after the war of course there's many other deaths dealing with independence movements, liberation movements, colonialism, of course, the brute force of colonialism. And so um, there was this field that came up in, um, discovering, asking how to resolve international conflicts, conflicts between states, you know, nations, new nations, uh, old, uh, older nations, and how to resolve conflict through uh, the rule of law. So that was the ultimate basic foundation of this field. And those who were part of this field from the beginning, from the, the Nuremberg uh, trials, you may hear this from history, 
you know, which was uh, addressing the atrocities of the Nazi Germany and trying them for the crimes against humanity. Those involved in the field was mainly international lawyers and uh, legal scholars, jurists, and how to um, hold people accountable for their crimes, as well as uh, reconstruct a new state uh, peacefully and recreate institutions that will not allow for states to easily uh, go to war. So that that's the essential history, general history of where this conflict resolution came. Let's be honest, it came during a time of war, uh, post-war, during times of decolonization. It came times of doing liberation moments. And, um, and for the most part, the field really focused on Western principles, Western juris juristic principles of um, ensuring human rights. And that's where we have the International U uh, Universal Human Rights Accord in 1950, the Geneva Accords. And then we have other human rights issues, but the emphasis was on human rights, on uh, rights for freedoms for individuals, where states cannot oppress their own individuals. And then so it moved from state to state relations to the way states treat their own citizens. So I say this because it's really important to know this basic background that uh, it was very, we call it top heavy, top heavy meaning it was very focused if you have a pyramid, it's very focused on the very top of the pyramid, the way states operate, the way states uh, have bilateral, multilateral relationships, the way states um, treat um, their citizens and other citizens. So it's very um, top heavy. The field actually, and then of course the United Nations that was established in the 40s and then it moved into as a, a vanguard to ensure that uh, no such conflicts could pursue and, and ensure uh, such a level, but of course they, they have limitations on enforcement. But they do have a, a, an office of peace building, an office of peacemaking, and so forth. And, 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 and so they have these uh, various offices and practitioners' offices. So when, do, when conflicts do break out, um, they did have um, official peacekeeping forces or peacekeeping uh, negotiators um, to come involved and get involved with these things. Uh, and also they have another separate office, the UNHCR, that helps with your refugees and education and so forth. So there is this responses to war that the United Nations set up for the international global system. And I think this is what I want to just stop at the first section, which is the global system that was set up by the end of the 50s was a, a sort of liberal democratic principles, uh, principles of emphasizing rule of law, emphasizing uh, principles of individual rights, principles of um, human rights, uh, in the, uh, principles of the rights between states and individuals, um, of, of rights and freedoms of, of assembly, of speech, of representation, of, of expression, uh, and rights of minorities, uh, wherever they may be, different types, cultural minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, um, racial minorities, etc. So, but the, basically what I'm saying is that the international global system was set up that this was the way to, to really proceed. Now, what I want to do is transition is this sort of values, global values within the field had a uh, parallel track in academics. And I'll get to Islam in just momentarily if you just uh, give me a another few minutes of your time. The parallel field in academics and within the world, liberal democracy, and in, in the 50s and 60s and definitely by 70s, was these very bold statements to say that the uh, presence of democracy and liberal democratic uh, secular societies was really the victory of the century and a victory of, if not our history, and um, we have the famous scholars and thinkers and philosophers who are saying that uh, since liberal democracy can produce and provide for the public good with the uh, liberal markets, it allows for economic mobility, allows for social mobility. 
so people can move from a lower class or an impoverished class to a middle class within these systems. People are allowed to be educated and, and move in social uh, mobility that way. People can choose their rights uh, and, and move forward, can express themselves. The point is that in this liberal democracy, um, there was this uh, very important de-emphasis on the role of religion. In fact, there's uh, uh, so much literature. I mean, I, I wish I, I could, I have an actual bibliography of all the scholars, of uh, many scholars, Peter Bergen from the Boston University, many other scholars who, who said the role of religion in any democratic society will be diminished. That there'll be less and less of a presence of religion because as people find economic opportunities, freedom of speech, um, freedom to choose their life and their own identity, their own path in society, and that they won't need to cling, and that's the word cling onto a religion or tradition that was uh, pre-modern. And so it's very common and to read these things, and that's this sort of an era I grew up in, that's when religion was viewed as insignificant and would have a diminishing role not just in society, but in global order. And so, of course, this is, a, this is not just Western-centric. It's not just what people are saying in London. This is all over from Australia to Asia to Africa scholars, Latin American scholars. Um, that there was this emphasis that religion, uh, because of its uh, need to ask for commitment, for dedication, for certain uh, limitations on what you can do and say and, and uh, sort of design your life, and that was the assumptions, that they, that will not coexist with freedom of, of uh, liberal democratic principles. And so I say this because in the literature of conflict resolution, this was very pervasive, very prominent. I also say this because this is very prominent in philosophy, religious studies, and political science and international relations specifically international relations in the middle of the 80s. So in light of the uh, Cold War between the United States and the USSR, the Soviet Union, in light of the, 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 the wars and uh, all of those wars from the 40s to the 90s, um, it was very common to say um, that the religion will be, in fact, be diminishing, but in fact, it will disappear from humanity. So you, now sitting in Pakistan, this is probably some absurd conversation, but <laughs> because you know the role of religion is very prominent from the very beginning, um, and we will discuss uh, you know what that means. But I just say it was never uh, diminished as the way it was described in some in textbooks. Um, many things changed in the world order, and made scholars stop to think. And I'll just say many many things from the Iran Revolution to the invasion of Afghanistan to, uh, uh, by the Soviet Union, um, the, all these other different things that made people think about uh, the revival of religion. So I leave that for you, okay? To, for us to think on, on, on that. Um, so I, um, when I was teaching uh, in Islamic studies and comparative theology history, um, to say such things, uh, what I just said and outlined as a fundamental thought, pervasive thought in academia, as well as international relations, it would um, it was a little odd, of course, because with those who study history of religion or history, or um, you would see the prominence of religion in everywhere, um, in, in a lot of places, just because it's not again at the top of the pyramid, it does not mean it's just dis uh, disappeared. What I, um, now, what, what really attracted me, and I guess most like a lot of people, was uh, during the uh, September 11 attacks, but even before, um, we were wrestling uh, with was religion violent, promote violence. Um, and in fact, we would hear and uh, scholars dedicate that if you look at all of this, the wars, this is again 1998, 2000, I saw one report in 1996. If you look at all the wars 
uh, back then they were courting the war, uh, civil war in Rwanda, which was more ethnic and tribal. But if you look at the wars of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Serbia, you look at other wars, um, they were saying, most scholars were coming to the conclusion that, uh, it, you know, the wars what we see are religious based. We're in, uh, incentivized, initiated by religious actors. So again, there's this, this bias about religion being the source of all religious hatred and religious problems. So if you look at, at India, if you look at the Philippines, if you look at some parts of Africa, you look at some other parts uh, in, um, in Latin America, this, these were scholars were citing how religion, of course, many uh, scholars um, use different databases and data collections and realized that that was, uh, it was wrong. I mean, many of the wars going on were more or less along the lines of uh, land disputes, territory disputes, uh, political issues, political party issues, and uh, of those sorts. It had nothing to do with uh, religion. People weren't fighting over uh, prayer or, or fighting over religious uh, doctrine. They were fighting over everyday issues of land and economics and socioeconomic issues. So, but I just wanted to point that out. If I may transition to how peace building then moved forward, uh, where we are today, um, it is a very more interesting, more developed. Uh, today, the peace building uh, conflict resolution field consists of almost every discipline, from political scientists, uh, sociologists, um, you know, uh, anthropologists, historians, and so forth. Um, of course, legal scholars, as well as other scholars. And the field of conflict resolution is also a field, is a discipline. I think just in, in, in this country, United States, where I am, there are probably um, 55 universities that offer PhDs and another uh, you know, 1,000 universities that offer master's degrees or bachelor's degrees in this field. So it, it's a field that's been established. and. Um, and people decide to use that, and, and it's usually interdisciplinary too. So, what 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 is this field now, and how does where does Islam and religion fit in? And uh, you know, and then I can better understand. So, if we can think of it as a circle, uh, a circle, and I'm just going from uh, a, like a clock from twelve to one, two, three, four. I usually have pr uh, PowerPoint presentations, but I thought um, I would get distracted, so I just use. So, if you look at a clock, I'm going to use this clock as a way. So. Uh, first um, would be at 12 o'clock, peace building is again, uh, is the rule of law and the advocacy of law and enforcing the law, principles of fairness and justice, uh, and that should be uh, the first and foremost. Uh, second, we have issues of, um, if you keep continue, um, uh, social change uh, for justice. So peace building involves those things that are that are unfair, the ways and efforts to correct it, and that's legally or non-legally, through NGOs or activism and so forth. Then it also involves uh, transitional justice. So if you have, ex have experienced injustice or oppression, the field has this area called restorative justice and transitional justice, and how to, in order to fully recover from these areas uh, of there's a whole areas of fields of how to institute uh, res and um, reparations, how to institute fairness, how to have be compensated, how to recover, um, and this also inc includes trauma healing. Um, there's also in this field is humanitarian action, right? Uh, indirect humanitarian work to ensure that if there's a, a crisis of, of, of efforts. A crisis of human a humanitarian effort a crisis. You have refugee support. You have emergency education, food, shelter, and so forth. Um, another area that includes, is, of course, uh, development. You know, explore the institutional reasons why there's a lack of development. What what is there? What what limits development? What are institutional resources are there? What are not, not is aligned? Um, Peace building also includes um, dealing with uh, uh, regional, global, and local threats. 
And what are those threats? Are the threats from crime, uh, organized crime? Is it due from um, human trafficking, narcotics, drugs? Is it um, um, uh, pressures from you know organized groups? Is it uh, is it is an inability to have proper health care, proper uh, access to education? Uh, so that's structural. That's structural institutional issues. And then there's a, this area of violence prevention and conflict responses. So when violence, to predict when violence would happen, uh, where it would come, uh, with violence in education, violence in at the workplace, violence at the home, uh, right? Domestic violence, violence on the streets, um, violence in the parliament, violence in, in, in where where could it erupt, and how to predict uh, it would come. And then, of course, what interventions would you institute? Uh, you know, interventions through dialogue, interventions through conflict resolution strategies, uh, nonviolent inter interventions, right? Um, and of course, in this is you know the uh, state institutions. What state institutions are strong, active, or inactive? You know, where where is the role of police, and how strong are they? What's the level of corruption? the role of media what's the, and what's the state media and private media what is the role of um, schools what is the role of and, and uh, what is the inadequacies of these different institutions and of, of course in these state institutions of healthcare, um you know state of hospitals access to hospitals access and uh, uh to to fair um treatment uh and not to be um to be in debt in all of these services. So um, and to, what I'm saying is that uh, this field of conflict resolution has become more holistic, right? Dealing with structural reasons why, what what are the reasons and root causes of, of violence, uh, dealing with justice and healing issues, and of course, think about violent prevention and conflict resolution prevention, and also uh, it includes conflict transformation. We can't, as human beings, we can't, we can expect conflict, but we can't persist in conflict. We can't be in, in perpetual conflict. It's just impossible. And so how do you transform from being in, in a world of conflict that is uh, being um, having incompatible values, being pressured, being forced to act this way, being, uh, you know, using direct violence on you, how to transform yourself out of this. So transformative conflict is also a subfield of this. So I, I just give you a, a layout, a, a map, also a, a, a landscape, a mapping of where we are today of this field. And, and in it, and I will share with uh, Dr. Majid uh, this sort of um, this uh, sort of uh, I, um, uh, picture, if you like, to make it life easier, so you can have it, inshallah. Uh, so now uh, to the crux of the issue of Islamic. You know, it is Islam fallen in all of this. We had the question of is violent, is it Islam violence? Is it is it contribute to any of this? And as you can see, it's not just Islam, but in, in the growth of this field, we've noticed that there's absence of religion. There's an absence of religious, uh, a conscious absence. Uh, where does religion play in any of this? Where do the great world traditions uh, contribute? Uh, and how do they contribute? And I must say that um, the UN, United Nations, just recently acknowledged the role of religion in the last 10 to 12 years. And it took many decades of United Nations, because it's a very deeply secular culture, very based on certain cultures and so forth, the religion. There was a fear, a literal fear of, of the way religion opened the door of religion, and you get into heated debates of theology, heated debates of religious practices, and my religion is better than your religion, whatever. And there was a fear of this, although it never would descend to that level. But uh, in recent years, religion has been acknowledged that it has an important role. All religions, uh, I should say, not just Islam. Um, we found more and more books by 1999, 1988, about the Catholic tradition, the Protestant traditions, the Jewish traditions, the Islamic traditions became more prevalent in the, in the early 2000s. In, in the Hindu traditions, of course, Buddhist traditions and different Dharmic traditions. About what is it? 
And I wanted to first say that what we did uh, in this field within Islamic peacemaking, if I can say, what happened first is people had a problem in identifying what Islam is. I'm talking about the scholars. And I think that's what we could probably identify as important. In the beginning, most people identified individuals, right? They identified Muslim uh, activists and Muslim um, peacemakers and said these are representative of that tradition. It may be true, but, uh, but and then and they did, did this with Catholic tradition and identified Mother Teresa or Dorothy Day in the United States or the Pope or some, some, some people, right? And so you pick individuals, men and women, and they said they represent that tradition. And what do they do and how do they work and how do these institutions contribute? Um, and that, that was the early days of the 2000s to show you know, that religious people operate in a tradition that informs them to uh, think about peace and peace building. That's an important step in this field of literature. But I think uh, to, to understand Islam, this is the way I've come, uh, come about it. Um, you now we have, Islam is, you know, many, many definitions, but I, it's basically, to me, uh, a composite of many contributions. When, of course, we think about the religious, theological components of, of the history of Islam, you know, the, the Quran Sharif, the prophets, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the prophets before him, their work, their literature, and say this is Islamic. Um, but within this, uh, there's also other dimensions. There's dimensions of culture, the different cultures of Islam, different societies. Um, we think of Islam has its, 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 because it developed into a civilization, it has its own philosophy, very distinct philosophy on, uh, on present, on living, on being, on, um, on, on, on thinking of the environment. So when you think of Islam, I also add the philosophy, of metaphysics, uh, culture. Most, 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 what's most interesting is that when we think of Islam, our, our friends, the Mulvi class, become the most uh, in front and say, we, we, we are the authorities on Islam and we speak about it and we are the, we are the speakers and owners. Uh, they're just one, one voice uh, in it and when we speak of Islam. So the jurists, of course, the scholars, the preachers, uh, the jurist uh, prudence, the Sharia, of course. Again, when we when I speak about them, I I see them as one important group, but not the only group. And I think that's a very important thing I like to keep saying, because when we speak of the Mulvis and the scholars and ulama as the sole representatives of Islam. Unfortunately, you, we tend to dismiss and reduce it to this group of class. And then we forget all about the other things I mentioned about cultures and society and, and um, aesthetics and, and philosophy, metaphysics, and all these other things, arts, um, poetry, and, and music, of course. Um, all these things that contribute to us Islamic civilization. So my approach is when we speak about where, uh, how to understand Islam and the peace and peace building is to include all of these things. Okay. And so um, that's, that's my basic difference from some of our Mulvi scholars and scholars. Uh, and some, some agree with me, some disagree with me. So I, I distinctly say that Islam, if you look at the uh, scholarly level, the scholar, of course you can look at the Quran Sharif, there are numerous uh, ayats and there's numerous hadith of the, the Prophet and his family of, of saying beautiful things about um, being kind to others, being kind to your enemies, uh, you know, even teaching those prisoners uh, how to read um, when you capture them. Um, um, to, of course, not stealing, being kind to your parents is an enormous um, uh, value. So these, all these, uh, you know, there's thousands and thousands in the, in the life of the Prophet and in the, in the Sirah of the Prophet. 
of course, uh, of examples of, uh, if you think within this religious theological world, um, there are many, many things to maintain harmony. And I think that's what I, I, I use more often is the term harmonious relationships. And I think that's what um, this particular religion is trying to install harmonious relationships. One amongst each other, uh, within siblings, within, of course, parents and children, but that's so the, per the interpersonal, the personal, um, but also uh, the community level, right? You, the individual, and your community, uh, not only your, your particular area where you live, but your, the different communities you belong to. You belong to an academic community. You belong to a community of, of students. You belong to a community of youth, a generation. You belong to a community of a, in a city or a village, or, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the community level. And then your harmonious relationships with um, this, you know, the large, broader society, you know, the state and the region. Um, but the harmonious relationships go into different other parts that the religion teaches us, which is the environment. And I think um, this, this very emphasis on climate change and the destruction of the earth and so forth, we have there's so many sources and, and uh, important scholars from Ibn Arabi to uh, Ghazali to you know, scholars from uh, Al Kindi and all these scholars from the past who've talked about the relationship of these individual to the environment. Uh, I mean, if you look at all of the beautiful uh, architecture, and we'll get to that in a moment, um, and gardens were important. The sound of water, the place of water, uh, the place of um, um, beautiful flowers and uh, prayers, uh, images of these gardens as being paradises uh, and places to, to contemplate and reserve one to be in, in harmonious to the environment. So you look at from Alhambra in Spain to Morocco to uh, areas of Timbuktu in Africa to Ethiopia to all the way to Indonesia and Pakistan, South Asia, Central Asia, all of the beautiful architectures, right, which symbolize this grand... Um, uh, devotion to the divine, but the divine is devotion needed to be beautiful and also be, you know, harmonious to the, uh, to the environment. So harmonious relationships to people, harmonious relations to the environment is what I see in our, in our sources. It's very clear. And of course, the, um, and I put the individual, this heavy emphasis on the individual, you can't do any harmonious relationships with anyone unless the individual is harmonious. There's a very deep, deep history, of philosophy, metaphysics uh, on peace of oneself, right? Spiritual peace, uh, peace with oneself, finding a spiritual, uh, striving to have a spiritual life that is uh, peaceful, that is uh, contemplative, that it acknowledges oneself with the divine and acknowledges one's love for the divine, but also love for all human beings and all things that are created, all things are created are part of uh, the divine um, creation. Um, so individual peace is heavily emphasized in the Quran Sharif and the Hadith and the history of the philosophers. Um, and so um, even in midst of global, of, of regional conflict, there must be a place to find peace, and whether it's through the prayers, the different types of prayer, the five times of prayers, through fasting, through charity, through love and kindness, and all types of chi and kind charities, not just through money, but you know, uh, kindness of words, kindness through uh, kind acts. Um, all of these uh, contribute to an individual level of a spiritual life and a spiritual peace. So that is the uh, very significant. Another area we say so the individual is important, the relationship to the creation, the environment is important to have these harmonious relationships. But what's important is that also this notion within Islam is that when it is not harmonious, you know, when we do have discord, which let's say brother and brother, brother and sister, brother and father, uh, whatever, 
it is really strongly emphasized in multiple sources that uh, you have to repair relationships. You cannot continue to, and you should repair them as soon as possible. So resolve any conflict between siblings or relatives or friends as soon as possible because uh, that, that repairing is a sign of an unhealthy, harmonious self. You cannot lead a very uh, harmonious spiritual life if you have discord relation, relationships with many different people, or even with one. And uh, we've seen this with the prophets as well as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on, on how things are resolved as soon as possible and not to let uh, time lapse. So there is this uh, element of how, how to repair uh, uh, relationships, but the need to repair and not to just wait and continue. So repairing relationships is important. Again, individual to individual, tribe to tribe, community to community, state between state. You know, it was very emphasized from the very beginning to ensure relationships that were um, harmed to be repaired immediately. So this, this notion of continuously having harmony in, in your environment, with your family, within your friends and relatives, um, within your communities, the various communities, you in, is, is extremely fundamental in the in Islamic peace building. Uh, but also is acknowledges when times are not. So people do experience divorce. People do experience um, uh, differences on money. If people do dis disagree on many things. But all of these are outlined um, in ways to address them in dialogue, right? And through dialogue, as we know also, through contracts. So it's not just you say things and you forgive and you ask for forgiveness and you move on, it's compensation. But within the Islamic tradition, it's very important to make sure people were held accountable, individuals were held accountable, parties involved were held accountable through signing and agreeing to a contract. And it's a very interesting because Islamic tradition came uh, out from an oral tradition, mainly from an oral tradition. And in this lifetime of the Prophet, there was a very important time to move, uh, to include oral to a print and a contractual tradition. So people will be held ac accountable. So it's not just the treatises he held with uh, with those um, fighting factions, but also individuals. If you you divorce, you this is you, this is what is is to your wife. This is to your husband. This is to your children. An inheritance. You cannot just you cannot forget your children. And it has to be written down. It has to be witnesses. There has to be uh, legitimate witnesses, and it has to be implemented and observed. If they weren't observed, those those legal contracts, then there were mechanisms to redress those things. So all to say is that the that there is a, a whole legal component to all of these redressing of discord. I, I know we're short of time, and I just want to say when we deal with Islam, this is how I look at it. Of course, various cultures from whether Palestinian culture, or whether it be Kenyan culture, or Mauritanian culture, or we deal with Pakistani culture, or Indonesian culture, Philippine, wherever cultures we deal, there is also in, indigenous cultures that have ways to resolve, uh, to have dialogue. You know, sometimes dialogue is dealt with in group. Sometimes dialogue is dealt with elders and then with group. So I just wanted to say that the cultures of Islam contributed to the ways we think about peace and resolving conflict. Um, and lastly, I would say um, this is an unexplored area. Um, I've been speaking to some scholars in Pakistan as well as in, in Egypt about the, you know, the philosophy of law and the philosophy of religion and its, its ability to think about um, um, peace, peaceful ways in res and resolution. So, it, you know, as we all know, philosophy is not a, such a, um, a, t a field that's growing, uh, unfortunately, but and, and we do have sources, we do have scholars that think about this, and I think um, it's a field that we need to expand uh, on, on this. So this is, again, just some basic foundations um, that I, I wanted to share with you today. 
and how it's interconnected to some of the past and uh, on current trends when we think about Islam and peacemaking. Thank you, and I'll, let's leave it open to questions and answers, inshallah. Um, thank you, Dr. Huda. Uh, um, now the forum is open for question and answers. Uh, we have been joined by uh, Professor Dr. Namatullah of uh, Institute of Management Studies and Professor Dr. Abida Banu from uh, Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies um, and many others, my social media friends as well, including my friends. So if any one of you have questions, uh, please raise your hands so that you can get a chance to uh, be responded. Uh, I'll just say one thing like uh, Dr. Uh, Huda said that dialogue is important uh, and uh, he has given, um, you know, or he has talked about uh, peace and conflict resolution uh, in Islam and how it is mentioned in the Quran, but uh, unfortunately is uh, misinterpreted by many who do not have the knowledge of uh, Islam or uh, even the area uh, uh, within peace and conflict studies. So dialogue, negotiations, uh, mediation, all I think are important when we have a system, whether it is within a, uh, you know, a culture or within a society or at international level. So if any one of you has a question, uh, Dr. Abda, if you want to, uh, you know, um, add in something yeah. to the students. Yeah, uh, sure. As a... Dr. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. And it hi. Uh, so Dr. Kamar, it was very, very interesting. Um, lecture come presentation and I enjoyed it you know uh, I guess a couple of days before we were talking about uh, religious peace building in the class and the idea of religious peace building in a society like US is like um, it just I, I, I thought about it like how would it sound like in the society of uh, US which is very multicultural and I mean you, you know there are many communities um, living so I, we, we had a little bit of a discussion like my, me and my class fellows and my, mm -hmm. my uh, students my something like which I'm really I wanted to bring up is okay, um, do you think other than the societies like here maybe in Pakistan and maybe in some other uh, context as well where religion is quite big in politics and um, kind of culture and religion and it's all is like mushed together. So it makes sense a lot of people resort to uh, Islam and refer to Islam quite often as, you know, uh, a potential uh, and viable mechanism for conflict resolution. But how about the societies such as US and maybe Canada and, and, and other Western countries that have uh, considerable, you know, Muslim minorities and, um, they have like, you know, their social system intact inside their homes, but outside there is a different system. So how do you think that this is applicable or could be applicable in societies um, such as Canada, maybe New Zealand and um, US and so forth? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, there are religious groups, uh, including, uh, you know, Muslim groups, uh, Christian groups, Jewish groups, many groups, Buddhist groups who um, operate in peace building. Um, and within, I should say, within Muslim groups, let's, uh, let's be a bit more thorough. There are Sunni groups, Shia groups. Um, there are groups that are, deal with all of these various odd things. Now, the way they operate is um, in social issues, I see more of um, a prominence of these religious groups working with, <clears throat> excuse me, in social areas. For instance, in the United States, there are nine major organizations that receives federal funding for helping refugee resettlement. 
nine major ones. And of the nine, there are seven of the nine are faith-based. Um, and so seven faith-based, like Catholic charities or Lutheran services, and, and of course, Islamic uh, relief and so forth. So that also shows you the government's heavy reliance on religious faith-based groups to help in resettling refugees and helping them uh, find housing and how helping find uh, um, in schools adjustments, having finding sort of uh, a, a, a very important um, uh, environment where it's peaceful for them to adjust to. Um, but uh, here in the United States and Canada, I found that uh, the Islamic groups are involved in, in three or four major areas. They involve with civil liberties and and um, and you know how to protect uh, not just Muslims but all those that are violated. The civil liberties are violated if there's a injustice in terms of um, a hate crime. And so there's a, a now a big network of, of lawyers involved to help uh, uh, reparations and and, and 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 to help that. Then there's also, of course, uh, another groups that deal with just shelters, um, food for homeless, and, and bringing food. Um, and then there's, of course, other uh, humanitarian groups. So I, I find that the Muslim groups are, of course, less than the other Christian groups or Jewish groups, but their prominence is now becoming more and more obvious, uh, involved in peace building, involved with re uh, um, resettlement of refugees. Uh, homeless issues. So it's involved with sort of that level. Um, yeah, so that, that that's so, so they are contributing, but they're contributing to uh, issues very unique. And, 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 you know, homeless is not unique to this country, but uh, the way you address it is, is unique, you know, what legal ways, what social ways, what economic fundraising ways, um, philanthropy, how do you access philanthropies and foundations? Uh, and so forth and so forth. So we find that there are, of course, Muslim groups very active in these, in these areas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have more questions? Yes, Madiha, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Huda for uh, uh, for the good, uh, great presentation that uh, he delivered. My question would be, uh, as we are uh, witnessing uh, a decline in re religiosity across the globe, more and more people are uh, either identifying themselves as not practicing Muslims or Christians or whatever, or even are are even not believing any on any superior being. But at the same time, we are witnessing an increase, massive increase in violence, they, um, religiously motivated violence, not only violence, but religiously motivated violence based on uh, on the victims or someone that is target of that violence, someone's belief, uh, religious belief that a uh, particular uh, community is believing in a set of religious beliefs, so they are being targeted. Uh, we can take the example of an entire family being run over uh, by a truck driver in Canada in June. So uh, what do you think can a religion uh, play in uh, preventing uh, such type of conflicts in future? Our revenge conflict because these communities feel sad and uh, uh, and the grief uh, leads them uh, towards uh, violent activities as well because they see themselves as being target of violence and in return they uh, use violence as well to get revenge or to uh, let loose their grief so how do you see religion can play a role in this matter Thank you. Uh, thank you for such a, such a great question. Madhya, and salam alaikum to you. Thank you for thinking about these things. Um, there was like, there was this background comment about uh, people are, are not having faith or in a divine being, but then we moved into question of religious motivated violence. And it, it is a it is um, a growing tendency. And I think all types of, of violence um, in conflict 
really is stems from you know many different things but i would say um what is one has to first ask is what is the rule of law what is the role of rule of law in in such violence so what what is the what are the particular role of the police and uh and the state in terms of uh finding those who were um the suspects behind this and bringing them to justice and um helping the victims so you know we have to have first and foremost um you know what what is happening uh that allows that is allowing such something to 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 address these issues so that's the my biggest question is how does this uh, occur um we see this uh in this in us and canada and around the world with many types of violence with whether it be you know with use of guns or violence of words or however and i think this is growing and uh, some people have called it the polarization effect where there's more and more communities are being polarized and many reasons why people are being polarized not listening to uh, or thinking through um issues uh dismissing other people's um perspectives not engaging in dialogue uh due to technology and social media groups they are stuck in some echo chambers of their own friends only don't listen to the other side they watch the same media don't listen to different perspectives so this polarization effect globally is impacting the way people think through issues um so but if we call uh, religious motivated violence whether it be you know hindu motiv- hindu inspired or christian or islamic or whatever it may be um we i also need to question that too you know because i need to question uh the actors may be muslims or christians or hindus right those who are perpetrating the violence um that 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 they are not the sole representatives of their tradition what they are these are individuals who are, be- who are believers of the tradition who are uh found some um motivation to to do some destruction and not being in harmony with the the environment so i would ask is it is it from their scriptural sources that makes them to do this is it their religious climate is it their philosophy is it is it their social cultural uh, issues is there a lack of something or there's addition of things or is this just a uh, inspired anger uh, that's motivating them to do a particular outcome that will be a release for some sort of of release so i i do question what is religious inspired violence or motivated violence i mean when people say uh can i get into specifics i mean here and around the world we find that uh, there are some uh scholars not scholars yeah scholars and as well as preachers and mulvies who say if you read this particular ayat that says you cannot have christians and muslims as friends in in in, in the quran sharif and and they say if you ever have friends with the muslims if muslims ever have friends with jews in particular you are going to be uh, condemned and also you are going to be one mistreated and then they'll take advantage of you and they'll mistreat you as of one sort you know the thing is if you take ayats from the quran sharif and you take it from a particular context and you ignore all of the sort of exegesis all the commentaries on this particular ayat about that particular ayat about Jews and Christians and you ignore all you know 1400s years of 1400 years of commentaries and you just say today oh see this is what it says i'm going to believe you ignore the fact that there's been divergent various multiple perspectives on this particular issue and it's never been a consensus that's one and two the what consensus that has been is that we can live together and you can have friendships and you can even intermarry so um so when these movies and preachers and pseudo scholars comes with that particular verse because because that verse then says you can't have these relationships and it means you it's easy and it's susceptible to incite violence and anger against them and then an entire community entire group entire nation so it becomes more greater my point being is um a verse that is specific and there's counter verses that says you can 
and counter uh, examples where you can intermarry, have good relationships, and you can grow. And historically, these two communities within Muslim uh, empires have had enormous amount of rights uh, in, in terms of dhimmihood, in terms of being a you know major, uh, having their own courts, their own judicial system, financial system. I mean, it's just an ignorance of the past, much less to know of the diversity of perspectives. So this is one example that I would say that um, when people say you can't have these type of relationships is there's a certain type of violence we bring to the text, right? And I don't say the word bias. I bring, say, violence because violence of, of thought and violence of, of violence of attitude and violence of, of what we want as an outcome. So if we don't want relationships with Christians and Jews, we'll just find a verse that will justify my violence and my attitude. So we'll move from there. So that's that's a quick answer to your question. Thank you, sir. Sure. Any other questions? Or I think Dr. Minhas might be just out for a bit. Yeah. So if somebody sure. has a question, please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, like the dominant na narrative about the peace and conflict is that we have to promote peace and to avoid the conflict. Uh, but there is a counter argument as well, where peace is taken in a negative connotation and conflict is taken in a positive sense, especially in a so suppressed societies. For example, in an organization, if I can see that the corruption is going on, and, but still I am in a peace, then I think here the concept of oral peace is not good. Here the best strategy is to have a conflict for the resolution of those issues. So what's the religious stance on this counter narrative of peace and conflict? Hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Well, that's Dr. Khansa, right? Good to, good to hear from you and thank you for your question. I, I, if I understand uh, the full comment and question is that if there is a situation where you're asking to be uh, and ensure a peaceful um, situation, a peaceful life, but you're in an organization that has corruption and that corruption is counter to peace, um, what do you do? I mean, there's many, many sources that says um, you know, some one perspective is that you should not be a part of it. Others is you try to correct it with your voice. Others you try to correct it uh, through different leverages and pressure points. The other is you have to reassess. You know, its impact on um, the type of corruption. Meaning, is it if your correction is going to do more harm, or is it going to do more good? So if you, if there is if your harm, meaning that um, so. Corruption in itself, we have to examine what you mean by corruption. Uh, is it just uh, misuse of funds or is it misuse of relationship, misuse of the organization for something else? There's many different ways to understand corruption. Now, I'm, um, of course, many say take an active approach, which is the things I suggested. And some others say take a passive approach, which is um, gradually uh, you're able to make an impact of um, undermining corruption through showing alternative ways to running the organization or being part of the organization by denying uh, participation in the corruption, by denying uh, your uh, ability to promote it, to advocate for it, by denying um, and having other friends and colleagues to join in and not partaking in the corruption. These are sort of active and passive ways to do it. But the ultimate way is, uh, is to, in, in Quranically, is not to make sure there's any harm in the process of, of instituting a resolution. So you, what we're talking about is actually the field of what's built up as conflict transformation. 
how do you transform the moment of corruption or transform the moment of conflict and what are the strategies you design to move it it may take a long process it may take a lot of things but it, there's there's many ways to think about it but the transformative involves strategies involves thinking and tactics thinking about um, group activism individual activism and so forth i hope that helped that one. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Nabatullah. Uh, his hand is raised. Yes, uh, yes Dr. Nabatullah, please go ahead. Yes, uh, my, my question was not about the how to deal with the corruption. Yeah. But my uh, take on peace and conflict is that peace is not always a good thing. And conflict is not always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, my take is that the peace in a suppressed society itself is harmful. If we are in a suppressed society and still we are believing in a peace, then it is harmful. In suppressed society, I think we should go for conflict to get rid of this thing. So when like this concept of promoting peace and avoiding conflict, I think it is very elitist uh, approach and top bottom approach to suppress even the people more to their ideas and all these things. If I, I just maybe we, it would have been good if I, we have some sort of definitions, right? Um, so conflict, the way it's understood in this field, uh, and again, it's a very broad term definition, is when there's uh, incompatible values or approaches by any two or three parties that's all it is so it's not always fighting it's not always disagreements of fighting or physical fighting this is incompatible so a, a, a disagreement of of values a certain time so a conflict is in conflict is um in this field is is thought of um natural there's nothing wrong with conflict in terms of people having disagreements and different values and uh, different approaches at a particular moment or time. The, the issue with conflict is that when it becomes, moves from nonviolent conflict into violent conflict. And then, then there's a whole different world of how to deal with that. People can have nonviolent conflict as long as you're keeping dialogue, discussion, debate uh, open and alive, and you can have disagreements. Uh, so that's that's my definition and the where it operates. So, but if you're saying in suppressed societies where people are advocating peace and 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 then you really don't address conflict, well, that's not really healthy, right? One has to address conflicts, whatever the, whatever the conflicts may be. I think the peace building approach involves debating and discussing and addressing conflict and the hidden hidden issues of conflict i mean the issues of you know what what disagreements issues of institutional disagreements personal community institutional all these disagreements are within peace building are dis, uh, are addressed so again conflict is not something that is negative but it's also viewed as being addressed so it's not always the values of positive or negative but how to address it need to address it and of course the conditions you address it I hope that helps out. Uh, can I say, add something in this? Of course. No. Okay. Uh, like you said, that uh, the conflict shouldn't uh, move from to violent things. But if we uh, see like Islamic tradition, uh, that is also a struggle against of a suppressed society, against a tyrant. In the first phase of Makki Daur, the date was based on dialogue and all these things. But later in, later on in the Madni stage, we still have Ghazwa and all these things. So I think that is not where the conflict is taken in the positive things in order to revolutionize those whole idea. Okay. Yeah, and I think we have to take those stages as a holistic approach, yeah? Medina, Mecca stages as comprehensive, not just one or the other, but dialogue continued in Medina, debate, thought, exchange continued in Medina, and continued in Mecca. Yep. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Madhya, I believe, um, wanted to ask a question or add a comment, and then um, my co-host Abda, uh, I think she wants, you know, wanted to add something. Ji, Abda. Okay. So I guess with uh, uh, Dr. Kamar, I think Dr. Namath was uh, kind of struggling with uh, with the, you know, the dichotomy, <laughs> like conflict is bad and peace is good. But, and I think he was more getting into this realist idea of, you know, what is desirable and is necessary. So that's like how, uh, but as you mentioned, that conflict is not like a monolith. It, there are ver various level of like, conflicts, so it's some disagreement and differences. But uh, what I wanted to add is like the the it it conflict is not a healthy situation. So there will always be some struggle and effort and strive for resolution. And 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 the aiming of aim would be to uh, to you know acquire that peace and harmony. So I guess we cannot really you know idealize on conflict as something necessary or maybe essential. Um, it, 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 but we can say that, yes, it happens. I mean, it, it's unavoidable in certain situations, as Kant would go back and say uh, in his perpetual piece that um, we cannot get rid of war, but then uh, it's possible that we reduce it, you know, through different models and, and um, approach it. So that was kind of response to Dr. Naimat. Um, Dr. Um, Kamar, I was thinking about this. Uh, you very beautifully, uh, you know, uh, explained the role of peace and uh, role of Islam in peace building and connection, you know, uh, uh, of Islam and conflict resolution. And being a Muslim, because we are we we are kind of into it, so we know that. How do you think this discourse countering Islamophobia? Uh, because as a uh, Madiha or some other student like alluded toward this religious, uh, religious religion motivated violence in the West, or maybe portrayal of the violence, you know, backed by uh, political Islam or something, so it has unfortunately increased this uh, Islamophobia um, in 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 some ways. And I have, I mean, I did my PhD from the US, so I kind of am aware of some of the the societal things too. So how do you see see that your, your the, the thesis and and the explanation you were sharing with us a bit earlier, um, it emerging as a counter discourse to Islamophobia or maybe like you know there there are different ways to look at Islam. Is it specifically to count Islamophobia or all types of phobia? Uh, Islamophobia. Yeah. You know, Islamophobia. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the clarif clarification. Um, I think it's um, obviously very important. It's a serious issue. It's, um, it's an issue, of course, that uh, only recently, I think, uh, Muslim activists have taken a, a serious um, um, consideration and ways to do it. And I think they're just beginning to understand the ways and strategies. But um, I think they're also realizing, this is, you know, the legal scholars and the activists and so forth, that there's, um, you know, the, the one way to do it, deal with it is to is you can look at it from the prophetic phase where these coalitions were made during the prophet's life and before other prof the prophets there were always coalitions made discussions were made so those other groups that actually exist you know civil rights groups other anti defamation groups and all these groups that deal with phobias we one should be able to have a dialogue with them and see if you can build a coalition against this type of um, this type of trend. But um, so I think that's a sort of a strategic thing. And I think that also some are very open to it, but others will not. And it's like, I can never reach out to a Buddhist group or, you know, a, a, a secular group and it would be a part of that coalition or, you know, whatever. I can never work with these people. And that's, that's up to you. It's, you need to think about that. Um, but, you know, Islamophobia, I think, in my prediction, will continue to grow because of the international politics. And this is unusual, unfair, but this is the result of many um, things that are happening um, for Muslims 
uh, because of the international relations issues and Islamic politics and the rise and influence of Islamist parties as well as extremist groups, this combination of multiple geopolitical reasons that you know we see manifestations of those who speak of Islam, it's very easy for the naive to say, look at what the Islam is trying to take over the world. They are dominating, they're violent. We don't return to, uh, and, and stand up uh, to this, then we will not, will be minorities in this sort of global hegemony of Islam. But you know, this, all of this involves, if I may be honest, not just left to activists and certain scholars some doing some good work. I mean, this involves serious debate within Muslim communities and academia, serious debates on why this is occurring. What is it the responsibility of us as individuals as well as communities? What is it that we can do strategically? What is it that can be done where Muslim minorities do not have a voice, you know, like the Rohingya, the Uyghurs, or those who have a, a, a good voice, but they don't have the politics behind the voice. They don't have the international support uh, of it. I mean, so this, these are very, very important debates that needs to be taken up seriously, not left up to politicians. I think left up to uh, good, sensible people uh, who can think about these things and also, you know, say, you know, what, what can be done and reach out to people and, uh, and reach out to the coming up with some sort of transformation. So every conflict, I think, can be transformed. And this is one that has to ask that. Can each conflict be tra transformed? Whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's the Ethiopia, one has to ask, can this be transformed out of its current situation? And if you think of that, and then you agree to those principles and fundamentals, then you can think of um, coming up with solutions through dialogue. Thank you. You're welcome. I think your voice is not on. Ma'am, please Dr. unmute yourself. Yeah, Dr. Minhas, you're mute. Okay. Uh, Badiha, uh, the last question from you, because uh, I know Dr. Hada is uh, a busy person. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, taking out uh, time from his busy schedule uh, is very huh? kind of him that he took out some time for us. But uh, the last question from Madiha, and then we'll say thank you together to Dr. Huda. Yes, Madiha. Assalamu uh, alaikum again. Uh, sorry, Dr. Huda, for taking up uh, your time again. Uh, I have another question. Uh, in conflicts, uh, where the roots of conflict are mixture of both religious beliefs and uh, political objectives, the best example could be that of Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, where the religion is merely used to further escalate the conflict, not resolve it. Do you see that it can be uh, sought out, the conflict can be resolved merely through political solution, or religion still has a role to play in such conflicts? Yeah, I mean, um, that particular conflict you just mentioned is a multidimensional um, conflict. And uh, as we can see, when the Oslo Accords was initiated and they thought this is the way to move forward, that accord was initiated in 1993, where uh, they said, you know, a two-state solution is going to move forward and this is how we're going to move towards a two-state solution. And so they try to move towards a solely a political solution. What we need is for this particular conflict is to have a comprehensive, all stakeholders involved in a very strategic way of resolving and transforming this conflict. And uh, unfortunately, um, in conflict studies, we speak about stakeholders and their leverages, what type of power they have, what sort of asymmetric power there is, uh, what sort of um, um, incentives they can be given to move um, powers together. So um, the Palestinians, particularly will need global stakeholders to move them and support them, as well as to leverage their interest amongst the, uh, with the Israelis. And global powers, I mean those beyond the immediate borders because uh, those immediate neighbors have their own issues, uh, also have their own restrictions. So I think it's going to need a very global approach.
to this because uh, things there are very um, uh, abysmal there. And I think they, as you said, can the religious leaders, yes, I think the religious leaders can. Those leaders that are interested in transforming the, the, the conflict have a role. Of course, there are many, many religious leaders in that region who have no interest in dialogue or debate and have very much tied to you know militias and extremist groups. So we have to be selective in who is possible in that transformative uh, process. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruzi. You're welcome. So with that, uh, um, um, I'll just conclude this uh, uh, talk. Um, we had very fruitful, uh, you know, uh, discussion with Dr. Huda, uh, as he is uh, an expert on the area. Uh, to conclude uh, today's session uh, with the Dr. Huda, I would say that Islam uh, as uh, a religion means peace uh, in all its forms and uh, it asks for justice in resolving all conflicts, whether they are between individuals, a community, states, or at, at any level, so that the aggrieved party is satisfied with the result and being at peace works for peace with all concerned. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, uh, Dr. Abida's question uh, was, is concerned, I think this. Uh, phobia of Islam, uh, which is uh, prevalent uh, uh, in the West, uh, I would say that there are a great many similarities between Islamic and Western systems for settling disputes and uh, peace building, um, such as, you know, communicating with each other like you your, uh, uh, in your representation uh, mentioned about the dialogue. Why don't we engage in dialogue that exists uh, in uh, Western academia or uh, the talks that we hear from experts who are uh, insisting on engaging in dialogue. Um, and, uh, and the same is the case uh, in Islamic teachings. The negotiations, uh, compromising and resolving, you know, our differences peacefully. Um, whether uh, they are at local level or uh, at uh, global level. Uh, but uh, uh, the general perception, however, is that the U.S. is pursuing uh, the peace objective, uh, but it often ignores the contributions of the Muslim scholars and practitioners in addressing various international issues. Like, for example, we have very few people as far as uh, peace negotiations are concerned from the Muslim world that are made part of any peace negotiation at international level. Um, um, and particularly from this part, from our part of the world. Uh, so, uh, um, I mean, either it is that uh, um, there is uh, some level of intolerance uh, in this part of the society or uh, lack of uh, academic uh, understanding uh, that uh, is mostly ignored by the Western uh, peace uh, policy makers or practitioners. Um, so so uh, ignoring the uh, contribution of Muslim scholars and practitioners in, I think, addressing uh, various international issues must not be ignored. You are one. You are contributing to peace through your lectures by interacting with different people, different groups, different communities, uh, communities that are different from you ethnically, linguistically, religiously. But you are interacting uh, with them. You are trying to engage them in dialogue. So um, <clears throat> I think efforts should be directed uh, to know. You know. Um, at altering, modifying, and uh, reforming the Islamic, uh, not only the Islamic societies, but other societies toward, you know, uh, moving together to have a peaceful internet.
I think Dr. Minhas is having some internet. I am sorry. I am uh, time and again getting uh, disconnected. There are. Uh, Yeah, I see there's probably some internet issues or connections. Yes, you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry again. Uh, so before I get disconnected sorry. again, let me thanks, uh, thank you, thank Dr. Kamrul Huda uh, for taking out time from his busy schedule and engaging them in uh, you know conversation uh, with each other and uh, with him from different perspectives thank you so very much uh, i'm very grateful oh you're welcome thank you very much i appreciate everyone's time and the uh, this is important um, because uh, to know the other we need to engage and yes. he's one of the reasons for uh, this uh, uh, lecture, arranging this lecture, was to engage with each other, to know each other, because I see there were so many people. Dr. Minhas is having persistently this internet issue. So, Dr. Huda, thank you very much for your time. And um, uh, we would like to hear more from you whenever possible. And you. your efforts are greatly appreciated. Okay. And on behalf of everybody, we say thank you. And uh, thank you, you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening and all your, your really great questions and, uh, and listening and hanging in there. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll stay in touch and we can connect again. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very you so much. much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.